Hey, how's it going? It's October, and that means it's spooky season. And with Halloween a uh, mere weeks away, it feels like the right time to do a Gengar solo run. This extremely popular Pokemon is very intriguing. If we look at the tier list from the previous few weeks, Pokemon like Alakazam, Starmie, Machamp, they've all done fantastic, each with sub three hour times. But if you look at the fourth spot, you see Ghastly. So if Gengar is just the fourth place Pokemon, but it's evolved twice, wouldn't it stand to reason that it has potential to just absolutely crush with a new high score at the top of the tier list? Well, not so fast there, big guy. Let's take a step back, bud. We need to take a quick dip into some preliminary observations. Gengar has great stats where it matters, and although its typing isn't as good as Alakazam's, and in both its special and speed are just a slight bit lower, it still excels in these categories like you'd expect. The move pool's pretty much identical to Ghastly, outside of a few things like Mega Punch and Body Slam available via TM, but they aren't needed in the pursuit of having the best time possible. Thunderbolt and Psychic are still the kings here, and where I'd like to take a moment to focus is that the starting moves are the same as Ghastly, and if you remember in that run, it's heavily reliant on Nightshade in the early game, and if you remember, Nightshade only does your level's worth of damage, meaning that it doesn't matter if you're using a Weedle or a Mewtwo, if you have Nightshade and you're level 10, it's going to do 10 damage, it doesn't matter. This means the extra stats on Gengar don't really matter pretty much all the way up to Lieutenant Surge, and finally getting Thunderbolt, when you get that, then it will become faster than Ghastly, but not before then necessarily. And with that out of the way, I'd quickly like to say that if you enjoy this content, feel free to go ahead and subscribe and click that bell just to be notified. I try to do these runs every week and those two things help the channel out a ton. Now, without further ado, let's dive in. As per usual with my runs, I reset for DVs at the start to get a good representation for the Pokemon that I'm using and after an easy first rival battle, I battle the one mandatory bug catcher and immediately it's on to Brock. And I actually lose the first battle with Brock. I wasn't really paying attention and since Bad does typeless damage as we've seen in the Eevee video, it does take me out. It's worth noting that this Bad shouldn't have killed me, but since confusion adds to its damage, I'm forced to do a really early reset. The next time, I pay more attention and the battle goes much better and from there, I finish Route 3 without healing because I really need to be optimized if I want to get a top tier time. It's worth noting that I do have to heal my PP before Mount Moon and this already has me conscious of Gengar's chances at being at the very top. Moving on to Cerulean, it's time for rival number 2. Like with Ghastly, 3 of his 4 Pokemon are immune to Lick and this requires me to use Nightshade. I still have it healed since Mount Moon and the only extra battle I pick up is the hiker that's guarding a hidden elixir. I do this because I want to only heal about maybe 3 or 4 more times total for the rest of the entire run to stay competitive with in game time. This of course means that as carefully as I try to manage my PP, I still have to end up using struggle strategies on the last 3 battles of the route, which actually does decent damage and it's not as bad as it sounds. This was paramount to avoid lots of time loss here in the early game. Afterwards, it's time to heal up and face Misty. It's not that bad of a fight, but notice that I use Lick on the Staryu since it's only water type, but then I'm forced to use Nightshade on Starmie due to the stupid bug that ghost types can affect psychic types. I get to about half health, but notice that I don't even start the battle at full health, so it's not that bad. Moving on, I think it's worth mentioning this little cluster of two trainers that have five normal types, which means that you'll need about 10 nightshades to get past here. This will deplete your PP and force you to use an ether if you want to stay on track to beat rival number three, then beat Lieutenant Surge before you dig back to Cerulean without healing. This is worth mentioning, and I like that different Pokemon have different trainers that kind of throw some wrenches into their plans, because most Pokemon would just zoom past these without a second look, it's just interesting to me. Aboard the SSN, I skip both Body Slam and the Rare Candy locked behind the gentleman to save some time and I immediately battle rival number 3. And this fight is very similar to rival number 2 in the fact that 3 of the 4 Pokemon are immune to Gengar's damage outside of Nightshade. I utilize it and Confuse Ray to get past them with no issues. And like every run, if you avoid Sand Attack, it's not that much of a hassle. I pick up Cut and then we head over to Lieutenant Surge. And this is 
one that also isn't bad. Getting paralyzed from Pikachu is the worst outcome, but I did manage to avoid that. If you want to know how worried I am about this fight, just look at the health that I started with. I used Lick on the Raichu for some reason, I'm not really sure why, because it's just a straight up time loss, and I'm going to heal immediately after this, but it is what it is, it only wastes a few turns overall. The real takeaway from this fight is now you have access to Thunderbolt, and finally we get a move that utilizes our special. Rock Tunnel and its preceding route aren't worth showing, and after skipping past Lavender Town, we pick up in Celadon City. I do pick up a Pokedoll for Mimic, which, spoiler alert, I didn't end up using, and I pick up Fresh Water for the Saffron Guards. I pick up Fly, and I make the short trek over to Saffron to pick up Psychic, which is essentially the final piece of our moveset. From there, it's time to head to the Rocket Hideout. I deplete all the PP of Lick, and after picking up the two PP ups in Celadon, I learn Psychic over Lick, and I use both of the PP ups on it to give it a nice 14 uses. Now it's time for Giovanni number one, and with Psychic, we're just absurdly powerful at this point in the game, and it's usually a generally easy fight anyway. I use Nightshade on the Rhyhorn to conserve some PP, but outside of that, there's not much strategy to speak of. With the Sylph Scope, I immediately head over to Pokemon Tower to fight rival number four. This fight is easy, but he does have some new additions, mainly the Execute that we don't have an answer for. I use the rest of my Nightshade PP, and I waste a little bit of time on War Turtle by putting it to sleep, but that's just because I got a little low and I didn't want to tempt fate and be too risky here. And we are cruising along after we rescue Mr. Fuji to obtain the Pokey Flute. It's time to blast Erica in one of the easier fights in the game. If I had to give you a guess of which of her Pokemon actually can survive a hit, I would have told you that Tangela would be the wrong choice, but that's exactly what happens. Victory Bell and Vile Plumes, half poison typing, being weak to Psychic, nukes them down, and with that, roughly half of the game is down, and Gengar is making some pretty great time. Down in Fuchsia, it's worth mentioning the out of place jugglers in Koga's gym. Psychic types are not what Gengar wants to see, and the two mandatory fights are filled with the plethora of them. It's not hard to deal with them, but they can be a hassle if you're not prepared, and they are definitely way harder than Koga. He has four poison types, they're all weak to Psychic, and the one problem that is usually wheezing self-destruct is a non-issue since it doesn't even affect Gengar. When I just said that Erika was one of the easier fights 20 seconds ago, I lied, Koga's the easiest fight. Afterwards, I obtained the Teeth and Surf from Safari Zone to finish up our HMs, and now it's time for a visit to our old friend, Sylph Company. I do take a slight detour to pick up the rare candy on the 10th floor since it's locked behind a grunt with a single Machoke, and it takes very little time to get past that, and then we make our way straight to rival number five and this one isn't too bad but it's an example of the strategy for the last two rival fights and the champion fight that we have left. Pidgeot is a one shot with Thunderbolt so that's good. Growlithe can survive a psychic with red health but a nightshade can cleanly finish it all. Execute is annoying so putting it to sleep feels the best. I do miss the first hypnosis and it goes for reflect. A second hypnosis connects and two nightshades bring it low enough for a retroactive potion so a nightshade will finish it off on the subsequent turn. Next up Alakazam is the real problem, seemingly like most of our runs. A first turn hypnosis miss means that we take a move, it goes for a side beam, but it doesn't crit. It does really good damage, but our special is good enough to survive at about half health. The next turn hypnosis connects, and a series of nightshades gets us past this mustache spoon cat without much issue. Last up is Blastoise, and it's the least of our worries. We have Thunderbolt and good enough special to survive even the worst case scenario. I don't one hit it but it just goes for withdrawal and it just accepts its fate. And that's rival number five in one shot. Now it's time for Giovanni number two. And you know the drill at this point. Psychic just demolishes Nidorino, Kangaskhan, and Rhyhorn with a single hit. But Nidoqueen gets a consolation prize because it manages to survive a hit. A Nightshade on the following turn finishes it off and we move on. And time is getting a little tight in the run, so I have to take a risk. I'm going to go ahead and fight Sabrina since I'm in the area, which is by far the hardest gem for Gengar. And let's see how it goes. The strategy here isn't too far away from the rival fight. I have to utilize Hypnosis on the Kadabra. Of course I miss turn 1 and the Psychic hits me for heavy damage. I managed to put it to sleep on turn 2 and I'm able to finish it off but I'm low and it's an uphill battle at this point. Mr. Mime isn't too bad. It likes to do non-damaging moves and Nightshade luckily is a 2 shot. We move on and we preserve some health. And hey look everybody, it's Venomoth for some reason. And guys, it's weak to Psychic. It gets disintegrated into the ninth realm. Moving on. And now it's time for the real problem. Our favorite, Alakazam. Turn 1 I go for a Hypnosis. And I missed. 
I've missed the last four turn one hypnosis if anyone is keeping a counter out there. Luckily, it just sets up a reflect. Turn two hypnosis connects, but it immediately wakes up. Cool. Turn three hypnosis connects, and this one sticks. I go for psychic for the special drop chance, and it wakes up immediately after that. The next turn I use hypnosis once again, and I'm just praying to Arceus that it just stays to sleep. Just, just give me a few turns. And it does. Two Thunderbolts do not do great damage, but they keep chipping away at it and it gets low enough for a Nightshade to bring us home and finish what's probably the toughest battle in one shot. It took a good bit of time, but I don't think it could be helped. And now we have to book it to Cinnabar as fast as we possibly can. Once I get the fly location, after surfing down, I make what is potentially a mistake and I'll document it for you guys. I go back to Saffron and I pick up Mimic. It was very pivotal for Ghastly to have this TM and I didn't want to be caught out without it when I'm at the Elite Four. So I go ahead and get it. Back in Cinnabar, it's time for, and everyone say it with me, Tombstoner, brother! And then we proceed to Battle Blade. I do actually lose the first attempt. That's because of how low of health I am because I'm trying to do as little extra inputs as possible at this point to save some time. But the second attempt, the first three Pokemon aren't too bad, although Fire Spin from the Rapidash is just an eternally annoying move, if anything else. Arcanine is very bulky, and for a second I get locked into a Super Potion battle, but eventually Blaine puts down the potions, and I get a critical hit Thunderbolt, and that gets us past without too much of a hassle. Now it's time to zoom over to Viridian and face Giovanni. Time is of the essence. I won't reveal any times at this point, but I'll just say that it's pretty close and that there's an actual chance here. The only real thing to say about this fight is there was an annoying amount of Pokemon that took two hits rather than one, and it wastes a little bit of time. Dugtrio actually hits a dig to waste another turn, but more importantly do some pretty scary super effective damage to us. But other than that, there's not much issue here outside of the fact that we could have been luckier, we could have been a little quicker in this battle, but I don't think it could have gone much better outside of that. Rival number 6 is up next, and I'm praying for a quick fight. Arceus be with us. This fight is nearly identical to how the 5th rival fight was. Pidgeot's a 1 hit, Rhyhorn is a new addition, and we welcome it to the Psychic 1 hit club. Growlithe survives a Psychic just like the previous fight, and eventually we move on to the Execute. I put this annoying egg to sleep to preserve my sanity, and the game cooperates with me and we get this one down pretty efficiently. Next up is Alakazam, and I'm a little surprised that the game is just being so generous with me right now. It must have been all those sacrifices of Pidgey and Metapods that I made last night in Viridian Forest. Anyways, I put it to sleep, it stays asleep, and Nightshades get past it without taking any damage at all. Blastoise is all but a formality after you get past the spoons, and although we do take some damage, it's another one-shot fight. Moving on to victory road, I do the absolute bare minimum. No trainer battles, and I don't even pick up the rare candy on the first floor. Time is very much of the essence, and it's crunch time. I swiftly deposit my Pokemon, and I use all of my rare candies at the start of this run. This seems to be the best strategy for Pokemon that don't have badge boosting moves, as the levels you could potentially get for being lower level are pretty negligible and not worth the overall time lost. That's my opinion anyway. Now let's take a look at Lorelei, and this fight's over very fast. Gengar is on a mission to get this over with, and Thunderbolt absolutely melts through her team with no remorse. If you like in-depth strategies, this is not the fight for you because it's over fairly quick. The only Pokemon not weak to the Bolt is Jinx, and it's still a two-shot. We're moving on. And next up is Bruno, and I know I give Bruno a hard time, but today, I want to give him an even harder time. He's weak. He's pathetic. He's worthless. How is he even in the Elite Four? He should be ashamed for what he does during this run, and I've had harder times fighting bug catchers on Route 1 than this fight. Next up is Agatha, and this fight is also very easy, as is most of the fights with her if you have either Psychic or Ground type moves. There is some element of luck with this fight, and that's because you can't quite one hit the Gengar at the start or the finish, and they will get one move on you. Fortunately, you kind of have to have some pretty bad luck uh, they have to use like a turn one hypnosis and put you asleep for a while. And fortunately, we're not going to see that today. The rest of the Pokemon are a single hit. And then when you get to the last Gengar, it's just like the first. This one isn't quite Bruno levels of easy, but there's no issue here. Now we can talk about Lance. And I've talked about this into the ground. Any Pokemon that can deal with Gyarados with ease and has a poison or fighting typing almost can't lose the Lance. We've seen it in the Ghastly run. 
Gyarados is going to come in and get absolutely obliterated by Thunderbolt. The dragons on his team cannot attack you. Their AI will just use their psychic moves like agility, so there's zero risk of taking damage. On top of that, Aerodactyl cannot even hit you with any of his moves because you're ghost type. And there's not much to say about Lance other than I try to be as fast as possible and that Gengar is the most tailor-made Pokemon to make Lance as little of a threat as he's ever been. And now it's time for the champion battle. Every rival battle to this point has been one shot, and the race on the tier list is very close at this point. Let's see how it goes. In my first battle, it's very predictable. My luck runs out. Alakazam just blasts me. I can't get the hypnosis to hit immediately, and when it does connect, I can't get it to stay asleep. We get nuked down. On to the next attempt. The second attempt, I'm seeing if I can just nuke it down and get some luck. I take a side beam, I get confused, I hit myself, then I take a psychic. It's just the trifecta of frustration. I could have won this particular attempt, but let's talk about it. I get past the hurdle, and it's on to Executor. The problem here is that although Executor can't actually do damage to me, it can put me to sleep, and that wastes a lot of time. And for the first time in any of my runs, I voluntarily reset what would for sure be a win due to the fact that wasting this many turns being asleep would assuredly make us slower than Alakazam and I wanted to give Gengar as fair of a shake as I could to get the best time that it could. And after that there are a couple more hiccups but they are essentially the same that we've already seen. Eventually I get an attempt that I keep and let's do the play by play on it. Pidgeot is the same as always. Thunderbolt takes it out swiftly and it's not interesting. The real change up in the strategy was I rely on a little luck here. Gengar has a solid crit rate, and if you use two Thunderbolts and just one of them crits, you can two-shot the Alakazam, and that's what's on display here. I take a heavy hit between the two bolts, but it's alright. It's not the safest play, but it's faster if you can pull it off, and it was surprisingly consistent for me. Rhydon is also a one hit, and I can't stop critting this Arcanine. I think it would be a potential three hit if I didn't, but the crits mean it's a two, turn knockout so I save another turn and that's just what we need. Executor is up next and I get the turn one hypnosis right off the bat. In hindsight straight nightshade was definitely a play but for some reason I go for psychic for the special drop and I actually succeed twice with it. It never wakes up, it's not a problem but I do think I could have saved some time here but I decide that I'm not going to reset. This particular attempt was just about as good as you could ever get. Next up is Blastoise and I've said it already. Uh, it's just a formality after Alakazam. A crit would have been fantastic here, but we don't get it. The first one triggers a full restore. It doesn't bother to heal after the second Thunderbolt, and it does a blizzard on its turn for a little bit of damage, but after that we take it out, and that's it. Run over. Gengar's completed, and overall, I think we kind of knew how this run was going to go. It's very, very, very similar to Ghastly, but it just has better stats, along with some arms and legs. The real question I had was, how much time could those extra stats actually shave off of Ghastly's 3 hour and 17 minute time, considering that the two have very similar early games because they rely on Nightshade, so the only thing that matters is what level you are. More importantly, is what's the final time? Did Gengar make it to the top spot? And sadly, I'm here to announce that it did not. It did, however, finish with a very respectable 2 hour, and 47 minute time, 3 minutes off of Alakazam. I didn't do a second run of Gengar, and I'm not sure if I could really shave off 4 minutes of time, as it's getting really hard to kind of save time in these runs. Off the top of my head, and I'd have to test these out, but I potentially think picking up Mega Punch to supplement the early game to allow you to not have to heal the first time, and probably until rival number 2, would be a time save. I could have also not battled the hiker near Bill's house, for the extra elixir. The other time save is that I could have skipped buying the Pokedaw from Celadon and I could have skipped flying to Saffron to get Mimic. And I don't know if there's anything else I could have really done to save time outside of just being more efficient in battles or maybe getting lucky and saving some turns. But overall, with all that in mind, I still think that that would only add up to a couple of minutes of in-game time and I don't really see the need to do a second attempt. But I do think Gengar was fantastic. It was one of the easier runs I've ever done. And I figured as much since we did Ghastly several weeks ago. I enjoyed it just for the mere fact that this is the OG Ghost Pokemon. It's one of my personal favorite Pokemon designs. And it's getting close to Halloween so it's very thematic. Uh, it was a very fun run. And Gengar cements itself at the number 2 spot. I think there's maybe 2 Pokemon left that could rival these sort of times like our last 2 weeks. 
But I am going to take a break from that. Next week, we look for the answer to the age-old question. How would some of the legendaries from Diamond and Pearl do if they were somehow available in Pokemon Red and Blue? And I have a treat for you guys leading up to the release of the remakes for those games, so look forward to that. Anyways, that's about it for me. If you made it this far, may there be many tombstoners during your spooky season. Uh, leave a comment below, whether it be criticism, discussion, suggestions, or just general chatter. Even if you don't have anything to say and you just say peanut, uh, I'd respond to it. And that's all I got for you. Uh, I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!